Hello, and welcome to Cloud Configuration, Mitigate Risks from Cloud Security Failures. If you're joining us live, our speaker will be answering questions in the post-session discussion forum immediately following the presentation. The forum link is available in the networking lounge. For audio video issues, please click the technical support button below. I'd now like to turn it over to Miles Palsha for the presentation. Welcome to this virtual series. It's really good to have you guys join our discussion today. I'm Niall Spelshak, and I'm super excited to spend some time uh, talking about cloud risk and mitigation with you guys today. You may be wondering why I chose this topic and why I want to have this discussion with you. Um, well, you know what? I'm really glad you asked. Trend Micro's uh, research finding indicated that cloud misconfiguration was the most prevalent cause of cloud security issues for businesses today. What they also find was that um, about 230 million misconfigurations happen on a daily basis on an average, okay? And even beyond that, what they also found was that 95% um, of IT decision makers um, are super concerned about class uh, cloud misconfiguration because they consider it a data security risk, all right? So these are facts that have been researched and reported, and you can actually look it up yourself. To take that a little bit further, DV Cloud also um, did a study, and what they discovered was that in the years of 2018 and 2019, that cost, uh, companies paid about five trillion dollars in data breaches, okay? So that's five trillion dollars that was, that was spent by companies that reported, not to mention those that did not report, okay? That's a lot of money, okay? So that's one of the reasons why I wanna have this discussion with you guys today. But first, I wanna talk about who am I and why am I uh, qualified to have this discussion with you guys. My experience come from 10 plus years uh, of IT work, um, sp spanning a broad range of disciplines from systems engineering to network engineering. Um, I've designed data centers. I've implemented data centers uh, for Fortune 500 companies. I've also um, uh, built virtualization for, uh, uh, for um, Fortune 500 companies. Um, so I have a vast amount of experience there, and obviously now cybersecurity. Currently, though, I drive uh, cloud security adoption for Cisco systems. And as you can see there, I'm also CCIE. All right, so let's talk about uh, um, cloud configurations and what are some of the issues that we are seeing. Well, first of all, we cannot um, deny the fact that enterprises are adopting cloud. And they're adopting cloud because of a lot of different benefits that are available to them, right? Some could be for agility. Some may be for um, the reasons of driving down operating costs. Um, it could be to gain, gain competitive advantage um, or, 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 or for whatever reason that you are adopting cloud cloud uh, infrastructure uh, solution, you should do so securely, right? There are different kinds of service providers out there. You know about um, your Microsoft Azure, AWS, um, Google has its own, many other companies have their own flavors and they all provide this to customers, okay? So if you think about a traditional, a traditional data center, um, what you would see is that most customers had a, a, a data center. They had to acquire the hardware for that data center. They will bring it in, they'll burn it in, and then they will, will load, roll it out to production. By the time they roll it out to production, maybe it's a server that they've made available for engineering, okay? At that point, that engineer that's using that server is not concerned about security at all, right? And um, typically they just start, you know, they hop onto the servers, they load the application, do whatever they need to do, and they feel pretty secure doing that. Now, when you shift to operating in the cloud, what has essentially happened is that you've shifted your perimeter and you've in, in shifted that towards the cloud. And essentially you've expanded your, your attack surface. 
right? And um, now when you operate in the cloud, um, things are a little bit different, right? It's really easy to just within seconds create an instance in the in the cloud and and, and do whatever you have to do, um, but you know there is a responsibility for security that you have to make sure that you obtain for your environment, right? So usually there's a huge question about who is responsible for what, okay? Is the cloud provider responsible for this, or am I responsible for, for, for that um, as a cloud consumer? Well, we have this particular slide that I have up here that basically gives us a picture of the shared responsibility model that's out there, okay? When we're talking about um, the cloud service provider, the bottom there is what you see that they are responsible for. Okay, so let's unpack that a little bit. So if you are a cloud service provider, you are responsible for securing the compute. You are responsible for securing the, the networking. You are responsible for securing the storage and um, everything that runs the cloud. That is the responsibility of the cloud service provider. So the hardware, the software that runs the cloud, the databases, all of that stuff. It's, it's the responsibility of the um, of the cloud service provider. Okay, they even you know you know uh, for the physical data centers they have physical security. That's the responsibility of the cloud service provider. Okay, now if you pivot that to the customer, what is the customer responsible for in the cloud infrastructure? Right, um, the top picture right here that you see is what. Uh, the, the, these are the items that uh, the, the customers are responsible for. Basically, everything that's in the cloud. So your customer data, that's your responsibility. The applications that you use in the environment, that's your responsibility, okay? Identity and access management, that's your responsibility to configure, operating system, your networking, your virtual firewall, that's the responsibility of the cloud uh, consumer. Okay, so that's essentially you know the 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 model that we need to we need to follow. You may hear some people argue about oh it really depends on the services here and there, but essentially, in my opinion, you should also always consider that if you can make any change in the environment as a root user, um, the general rule is that it's up to you to secure that. Okay, now let's talk about some some common types of misconfigurations that we see in the cloud infrastructure. So what are the common misconfigurations that we see in, in cloud? Um, the first one I wanna talk about is IAM. Okay, IAM stands for Identity and Access Management. And this is um, actually a tool that the cloud service provider provides to cloud consumers so that they can create, uh, create users and groups for their enterprises, okay? It's called the I am. And what we found out uh, according to research is that I am's or identity and access management is an extremely common security weakness in the cloud infrastructure. Okay, so that's why I want to talk about it today. Um, yes, uh, I am's are, you know, uh, um, you know, you are responsible for that, right? This tool is provided to you by your cloud service provider and you have to configure it and you have to make sure that you configure it in a way that is safe for your enterprise. Okay, take for instance, a root user. There should never be anyone in your environment that has access to everything, okay? If you use, if you take for instance, they're, they're root user, they may have access to create services, implement services, configure them. Right, that person, um, they should not be someone using the root user um, username and password to make configuration changes in your environment. But this is actually happening where you have users that uh, are, are able to perform all kinds of action in your entire environment. That's ex that's that's extremely dangerous. Okay, why? Um, take for instance that person. What if they share the credentials? with other people, right? In a traditional IT environment, I remember, you know, a password that was stuck in a, you know, an, on a sticky note, you know, and everybody all used that same username and password, right? You 
want to avoid that. And if you have one person who has access to a full range to your environment, it's really hard to avoid that. That's one thing, right? Number two thing is how do you perform audits? Uh, how do you know who's doing what in the cloud environment, right? And let's say something happens and you piss that employee off, right? Um, so you piss that employee off. That person has full ring in your cloud infrastructure. Guess what they could do? Well, they may open up back doors in your cloud infrastructure. They may open up services. You know, essentially, they may become an insider threat to your organization, right? And what are you going to do? Fire them? Well, let's say you do that. You fire them. What you're essentially doing is making them become an outside of threat because they had a full reign in your environment. What they have, you know, they may have um, created some back doors, some side doors, started some new, some new um, services that you were not aware of. Well, it's just really, really, um, it's one of the problems that we're seeing is that people are giving full reign access to, to, to so many single users in the environment. And that is a misconfiguration. The second thing I want to talk about is the lack of uh, MFA. MFA stands for multi-factor uh, multi authentication. Okay, uh, multi-factor authentication is basically a simple tool that gives you an added layer of protection. Okay, um, you will be so surprised to know that a lot of cloud, form, uh, cloud platform consumers are not configuring MFAs. They are not right. Um, you know, we are accustomed to, in the traditional IT environment, we are accustomed to um, the server admin, you know, using the Active Directory to, you know, create a domain, create groups, create users. Like groups may be like, you know, your HR group, your marketing group, or perhaps your, div your, your engineering group, and then grabbing users and dropping into, into those groups and giving them the permissions that they need, okay? Well, when you shift into the cloud, it's it's um well first of all once you give them you know those 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 permissions those are the user credentials that they use to log into those services in your environment okay but it's important to take that additional step and say okay well I know that you can verify you know using a password what else can you verify and MFA allows you to add that layer of protection for your environment. And you can configure it for tenants, you can configure it for service APIs, you can configure it for IAM users. It's important. And, and you can actually put a soft token on your phone that people can use. Or you can actually provide, provide a, you know, um, a, a, a hardware token that your users carry about. But you know what? This is one of the misconfigurations we see in the environment. It's just that people are just not configuring MFA. Okay? That, that's just the word on the street. The next thing to talk about there is uh, unsecured credentials, right? Are you creating strong password policies for your enterprise? Okay, I know some people like the government agencies, those are required to actually um, use complex, pass complex passwords and they, um, they use that and they follow those protocols, but there are some enterprises that are not doing so. And so it's important for you to evaluate that and and um, and find out you know if 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 you are using well first of all do you even have rules in place if you don't you know what do you need to do to get that created right do you create groups in your environment do you add users to to, to that environment you know do you appropriate permissions do you perform audit because if you're not doing these things then you know you're setting yourself up for a, an opportunity to be attacked okay so that's for I am. Those are just really quick things that you may be able to go back to your environment and be able to quickly uh, make some changes and, and provide some added benefit in terms of security in your cloud infrastructure. Now for security groups, security groups are basically firewall, right? In a traditional IT environment, you may have your data center. And when you have that data center, um, all customers that I have not made a customer that don't have a firewall in place. Okay, that firewall is basically the guy that stands at the gate and say, "Well, you know, your protocol 22, you can come in. Your protocol 23, no, you cannot come in." You know, basically, it filters what goes in and out your environment, and that's what happens in the traditional environment. Most enterprises have that 
hardware firewall, perimeter firewall. And when you go into the cloud, it's no different. Okay, you need to have um, you need to have security groups. That's the terms we use: the security groups that allows you to basically filter what comes into your services, the content into your cloud infrastructure, and what goes out. And what we're seeing is number one: they are improper attachment. What does that look like? Basically, what I'm referring to is the idea that you have good intentions and you create perhaps 10 different security groups, right? You create 10 security groups because you have possibly, let's say, 10 services, 10 different services, okay? And um, you apply the security to those groups. What happens when, let's say, you have an additional service that's coming up? Maybe it's a file server that you need to create an instance for, right? If you go in there and just go ahead and grab whatever security groups is available there, you can possibly improperly attach the wrong um, filtering to that file server, right? It's kind of like, you know, possibly grabbing a web server or web application security group and applying it to a file server that may contain your PIIs, maybe even crown jewels. It just doesn't make sense. So what we're seeing a lot is improper attachment. So it's important to kind of survey your environment, find out are you improperly attaching security groups to the wrong services, okay? We're also seeing um, some default attachment. So people just outright saying, well, you know what? I need to get this up and running. I'll create maybe two or three security groups, and then I'm going to just repeatedly use, repeatedly use that across all my infrastructure, okay? That is a misconfiguration and can open up a lot of uh, opportunities or increase your attack surface, you know, beyond just, you know, being a, being a cloud consumer, okay? Unrestricted ports and protocols. So, like I was talking to you about the firewall in a data center. That firewall is the guy that decides what goes out and comes in. And in a traditional IT environment, we have security engineers. That is your sole job is to make sure that what comes in and out on a daily basis is allowed and permitted. They determine, okay, I, I, I want to allow a source from 1.1.1.1 to come into my environment or not, right? When you shift into the cloud, that is still a requirement, okay? Because if you go out there and what you essentially do is if you open all the ports in your security groups, because that was the simplest and quickest thing to do, when you open all the protocols in your security group, because that's the easiest thing to do, you know, from all sources and to all destinations, that's another misconfiguration that you're basically putting in your environment. So we're seeing a whole lot of that. So it's important for people or cloud consumers to take the time to evaluate their environment to see, you know, this security group that I've created, it's a web application. Well, at the very least, I know I need port 80, and I, I also need port, port 443. And perhaps you don't even need 80, but, I, you know, you need, to you need to identify those ports that you need and only allow exactly what you need to those services, okay? All right, so for storage, this is really, really interesting. You have to think about, um, you have to think about, are your storage publicly accessible to, to, to the internet, right? What we're finding is that a lot of customers are not aware if their storage is actually publicly accessible, okay? This could pose a huge risk, okay? In terms of data breaches, um, like I mentioned, maybe you have a, a file server that has PIIs or crown jewels, right? Um, you want to make sure that, um, that you know, they're not publicly available, right? In fact, I want to share an example with you. Um, sometimes when you're configuring your, in AWS, if you, are, if you go into your control settings, you might see um, a button that says authenticated users, okay? If you see authenticated users, and, and, you know, to an average person, you may think, well, what this means is that um, people that will have access to the storage are authenticated users for my enterprise. And that's an error, okay? But authenticated users in that particular feature is indicating um, anyone, any customers that can be authenticated to Amazon Web Services. Right, so tenant A can now be authenticated to tenant A, and because they are 
at AWS customers, they can now have access to your environment. That's a huge risk. That's a huge risk because when you um, are operating in the cloud and you've increased your attack surface, that means that the attackers are constantly you know, scanning the internet. What they want to find is someone who's just out there that has not put up the firewalls, that have not put, on, put up the tools to, to protect their environment. And this is one way that uh, uh, data is getting compromised. Logging. Yes, you'd be very surprised to also that there's a lot of enterprises that are not logging things in their environment, right? There's no object versioning. How do you know what to roll back to if you're not recording these things? And if you're not logging, how do you know to, how, how can you go back and review that data and find some security gaps that you can now close, right? It's very, very important to do these things. And what we're seeing is that, you know, people are just not doing these things. So these are, you know, a few of the, the, the common types of misconfiguration that we're seeing in, in uh, according to research in cloud environment. Now, what are the common causes of these things, of these misconfigurations? There are several of them, and, and here I have listed a few of them. Number one is just that that, the, that shared response, shared responsibility model. Um, people just don't understand where that line is, right? They question it, um, and so. Uh, they don't take the time to understand which aspect is their responsibility to protect for the environment. And like I said, for the for general rule, what I always suggest is that if a root user has access to that service, okay, then you, it's your responsibility to protect. Okay, so that's what I always suggest. But that's one of the common causes we don't understand where that line is drawn at. Um, default configuration. A lot of people are using default configuration. Well, we know that uh, any organization has access to uh, a lot of different services to be able to deliver what they're in the market for. So default config configuration, you know, cannot be enough for them to protect their entire environment. So that's one of the causes. Um, quick spin ups. Yes, this one is huge, right? We have, um, before the pandemic, right? There were a lot of uh, engineers that will go to the office and do their work, right? Now, post-pandemic, a lot of people are working from home. And, you know, in some, in some environments, it's required for a developer to file a ticket. And when they file that ticket, they go ahead and wait for, for someone to create that instance, apply the correct security groups, and then turn around and say, hey, here's your instance. You can go do whatever you need to do, right? Now, an engineer is saying, well, I know how to create an EC2 instance, so I'm going to go ahead and create that, and I'm going to grab the default configuration um, for security groups and apply it to, to, to my uh, instance, right? And what they forget is that there are some security aspects that, that, that you know, they may be opening themselves to. There may be some security issues with that default attachment or something that they need to protect um, that they may not be aware of. And, they mean well, right? These developers or engineers, they mean well. They want to be productive. They don't want to be held back by the process, okay? And it's, sometimes it's really easy when they finish, they forget about that. They, ha they may have had intentions to go back and protect and, and put the, cro the proper security group on there, but it's really easy to forget that. Um, and so that's one of the common causes. Uh, lack of policies, lack of templates. Uh, you should basically... Um, have some, you know, predetermined policies that you in a template build for your users to compare to 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 uh, to to, to um, consume. All right. What we're also noticing is that there's a lot of lack of expertise. Right. In this day and age, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, I know how to sing the song A B C." And so, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to become an expert. I'm going to sing the the A B C song because I'm an A B C expert. Right. And that's just, you know, you know, maybe taking it a little bit out of context, but essentially there are a lot of people that are creating YouTubes and blogs and they don't really have the expertise to be teaching people on cloud infrastructure. And if you don't train your users, they're going to resort to those free resources that may not be accurate. And so that's what we're seeing is a lack of expertise, a lack of time. Um, we have, uh, you know, cloud admins that don't have professional development time to, to, to learn what they need to learn to do their job, and obviously because of budget.
right? So this is some of the common causes that we're seeing that's leading to those misconfigurations in the environment, right? So now, what can we do about it? What can we do to go ahead and mitigate from some of these things that we're seeing? Excuse me. There are several things that we can do to, to begin to mitigate, um, you know, from some of this misconfiguration. The first thing I, I want to uh, bring to our attention is security baseline. Do you have a security baseline or not, right? Um, no matter what industry you are in, right, we all have regulations that we must adhere to. Okay? Perhaps you can use that as your baseline for your environment, but don't stop there. Define your specific security templates for your environment yourself, in addition to the compliance requirement, the compliance control, okay? Uh, discover the current misconfigurations. Like I said, Trend Micro said that there's about, on a given day, there's an average of 230 million misconfigurations. How many are in your environment, right? Um, use tools to discover those misconfigurations. Be proactive. What are you doing in your environment to make sure that you have visibility into these misconfigurations? Okay. Um, at Cisco Systems, we, we like to actually eat our own dog food. So whatever we're putting out there, we like to consume it. And there's a tool that we are actually using that is a Cisco solution. It's called the, the Cisco Secure Analytics. Okay, Cisco, Cisco Secure Cloud Analytics. This guy um, enables us to know every entity that is in the environment. This guy enables us to know, to, to see every conversation. Are you able to see every conversation in your environment? Are you able to understand what's normal? Are you able to... To, to, to know when something changed? Do you get alerted when something does change? Are you able to respond to threats really quickly, right? And remediate, right? Um, this is what Cisco, Cisco Cloud Security Analytics allows you to do, and we actually use that at Cisco Cloud Security. So um, in essence, the Cisco Cloud uh, Cisco uh, Secure Cloud Analytics allows us to, to, to to um, have visibility into your network, allows you to, to get reporting in your environment. It allows you to identify threats. Um, it, it allows you to identify uh, IOCs, indicator of compromise, right, and policy verification. So that's something that I want to share with, with, with you guys there that you might, you know, be able to take a look at and see how that might help you in your environment, okay? Uh, do you leverage the principles of list privilege? Uh, do you leverage that in your environment? Um, uh, there are several tools that will allow you to do that, right? There are several tools that will allow you to look through your environment and say, you know what? Um, I give this person 10 permissions and they actually need nine. Let me take that 10th one away, right? So you can use tools to do that. And automate, okay? Automate your spin-ups. Automate with your templates. These are things that can actually help you. Um, and so with that said, I want to end um, my conversation with you is that we know that cloud adoption uh, will only continue to grow significantly, okay? Make sure that you take the time to leverage the shared responsibility model, figure out what your responsibilities are to protect your environment, and then the cloud service providers will also do what they need to do to um, protect your environment. And that concludes my, my, my discussion for you today. Thank you for joining. I'll see you next time. All right, guys, also uh, feel free to hop over to the networking lounge. I'm going to be over there addressing your Q&A. So feel free to, to meet me over there. So let's have a discussion and let's talk about it.